Hello and welcome to Biblical Justice A to X. If you're joining us in the live audience, please be sure to close your other computer programs for the best audiovisual experience. Global Justice is pleased to bring you this video series each month discussing a wide range of justice issues from abortion to xenophobia. This month's video conference will focus on the important justice issue of education. And we're particularly pleased to have with us our expert panelist, Professor Douglas Reed from Georgetown University. Welcome, Doug. Hi, glad to be here. I'm Sosa Misamia Burnett, and I serve as president of Global Justice and will be the moderator for this session. So, Professor Reed, I'm going to start us off with just a bit of an introduction of you, and then hopefully you can share a little bit about your work at Georgetown, particularly in the program on education, equity, and justice. So, uh, give me a moment to do the introduction, and then we'll have you share. So, first of all, Doug Reed um, currently serves as the co-founder and director of the program on ed education, inquiry, uh, and justice at Georgetown University. It was recently created to uh, follow up on views on education and teaching arts as a central element of the liberal arts. He has been teaching and researching on a wide variety of topics related to education, including educational politics and policy making, American political development, and American constitutional law. Most recently, he wrote the book, Building the Federal Schoolhouse, Localism and the American Education State. He's currently working on a project focusing on the politics of implementing the Common Core state standards, tentatively titled Politics of Proficiency, Common Core, and the Inequalities of American Education. Dr. Reed's earlier work also focused on the politics of educational financing and the nature of American um, education and state constitutionalism. He's also been involved in research and writing on issues of race and desegregation in Ameri and American federalism. He's also been given the opportunity to serve as the Spencer Foundation Postdoctoral Fellow with the National Academy of Education, as well as the Carnegie Scholar with the Carnegie Corporation of New York. More recently, he's been the Woodrow Wilson International Scholar with the International Center Program in Washington, D.C. Welcome again, Professor Reed. Thanks. Uh, introduction was far too long. <laughs> <laughs> it always is, but so many good things to share. No. And may I also mention that you also carry a PhD, uh, a Master's in Philosophy and a Master of Arts from Yale, as well as an undergraduate degree from UC Santa Cruz. So great to have you with us. So Bye. take a few minutes with us, if you would, and share a little bit about your work there at Georgetown, and particularly with this program on sure. education, and equity, and justice. So um, education, inquiry, and justice is an undergraduate program at Georgetown. Uh, it started in 2012, um, and it was really aimed at harnessing a lot of the student interest that we had at Georgetown uh, for folks who wanted to go into education, uh, either in uh, education policy and advocacy, or we had a lot of students who were going into alternative credentialing programs like Teach for America or other um, uh, into, into teaching. So we thought that we would try to um, use the existing set of courses that ranged from uh, sociology of education to uh, democracy and education course that I teach to educational justice courses um, to really give students uh, a, a firm foundation in education policy but also the important questions about uh, pedagogy um, and sort of asset-based approaches to learning um, uh, and you, focusing on social justice as a cornerstone of of uh, educational reform efforts uh, in the United States. Um, recently, I've just transitioned out. I'm no, I was the co-founder, but I'm no longer the director. Uh, Dr. Sabrina Wesley Nero is the director now. Um, I'm uh, now we're starting another program. Um, we keep spawning these things, uh, which is a master's program in educational transformation. But they're very, very similar in approaches. The the master's level program takes has basically the the same normative commitments and same uh, assumptions about learning and about pedagogy and about advocacy and we're, we're trying to move this into a, a graduate level program that will train uh, professionals to move out into into the worlds of educational advocacy, educational policy and learning and teaching. So, Great. Well, thank you for that great introduction of your work there as well. So I'd like to dive us right into our topic, and our topic is education as a justice concern. So before we get into some of the you know, philosophical or other background on that, let's talk about some facts and figures. What are some things that the public needs to know about this topic of education, particularly from this justice lens? 
So, you know, we've got a traditional understanding of public education in the United States as sort of bound by local control and that local communities come together and uh, pull together resources and, and uh, uh, educate the next generation of, of citizens. And that's in many ways still true, um, but at the same time, we've got a very changing demographic uh, composition of, of students in the United States. Um, roughly one out of five students uh, in the United States is an English learner. Um, and in many places, um, um, white students are, are in the minority uh, in, in many states, in California and increasingly in Texas and elsewhere. Uh, so we have, a, we have a, a growing non-white population in the United States, which the United States has never really done a very good job of educating uh, these student populations. And we've got uh, increasing complexities of how to educate with rising numbers of, of English learners uh, and, and uh, newly arrived students. Um, and so uh, one of the real challenges is, is taking an existing educational system uh, that's been geared for one uh, kind of population and, and, and in some ways reorienting it to the kind of students that we have now. Um, it's also incredibly important to realize that at no point in American history is education more important as a pathway for social mobility and uh, uh, as a way to uh, raise the educational standards of, of, I'm sorry, raise the income standards of mm -hmm. households and the United States. So um, uh, if you look at the numbers of uh, uh, jobs that are being created in the United States today, the vast majority of those jobs, new jobs that have been created since the Great Recession, they all require a college degree. Um, mm -hmm. um, but if we have segments of our, our, our nation uh, where going to college is not accessible or not possible either for financial or academic reasons, those folks are going to be left out of, of, of our economy and out of our, um, uh, our civil society in many ways because they'll, uh, uh, in, in effect, they'll be left behind in, in a very real sense. So we've got to pay attention to getting everyone up to uh, the level of being able to go to college and to ensure that they can afford uh, college. Uh, and so. We're really concerned about the academic preparation, but also the policies that support uh, uh, educational achievement in high school and beyond. Mm -hmm. Great. And just as maybe a follow-up to that, you know, you've written quite a bit on federalism, and there is an argument that you know education should really be focused in sort of state and local levels. Um, but there's also a similar argument that says, but you know, oftentimes state and local may be failing students that are disadvantaged, you know, either by racial group or socioeconomic status and that more federal needs uh, and federal you know, sort of oversight it needs to be involved. So could you speak to that a little bit and, and how you would address so, that? So, you know, education creates strange bedfellows uh, in a political sense. Uh, you know, if we think about the 1960s and 70s, the federal government uh, uh, and the efforts to create education as a sort of a really national right, which isn't in the Constitution. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a right that's created by state constitutions, uh, but we really had a push to sort of lift the floor of education in terms of uh, civil rights for um, African Americans in the South who had grossly unjust educational systems for um, students with uh, uh, special needs. Um, mm -hmm. Those students were often uh, neglected or left out of, of schooling uh, up until the early 1980s, in fact. Um, and then um, other students uh, whose linguistic uh, uh, backgrounds make it more difficult for them to sort of access learning and having making sure that they have the opportunities to learn at a high level. So the, the federal government has historically really worked to ensure that everyone has access to educational opportunity. Um, and so that's the sort of inspiration for what Arne Duncan is saying, education is the new civil right. Um, sometimes that's in tension with local commitments and values. Um, it was particularly in the civil rights movement in the South um, uh, and in changing communities where um, uh, new arriving immigration populations are creating political tensions. There can be real difficulties in adjusting. Um, but when the, when the federal government works best in education is when it's creating opportunities for students. Um, at the same time, there's a very important role that com communities play um, in legitimating educational um, uh, processes uh, in terms of school board elections, but also in terms of property tax base. Mm -hmm. Roughly 45% of all revenues in public education 
come from local property tax uh, revenue. So it's really important that, that local communities buy in to uh, what it is that they're creating at the local level. Um, so I look at this as sort of a, uh, an interactive dynamic where the federal government is urging everyone to sort of pursue uh, the better ambitions of our character uh, and, the, and the local governments are, are uh, uh, in many ways have a, have a firm sense of what their community needs uh, and, in, and when it works really well there's, there's, a, there's a fusion of those. Um, in different places of, in the country, we have different kinds of, of tensions over these issues, um, but that's sort of, uh, well, that keeps me in a job because uh, I, can, I can try to help analyze some of these things and hopefully uh, we can figure out patterns that uh, work, uh, work for all communities. Great. Well, you know, we understand that education is a very complex issue, but at the same time, you know, we sometimes have to make the argument, oh, why, why do we need to look at this as a justice issue? You know, you're at Georgetown University. It has a very strong Jesuit tradition and with a very strong emphasis on education. So would you share a little bit maybe about sort of either biblical, philosophical, ethical underpinnings of education? Why should we consider it a justice concern? Well, um... Education, I, I, I do teach at Georgetown University, which is a Jesuit institution, and I, I won't do an injustice to my colleagues who are theologians and, and biblical scholars because I, I make no uh, uh, pretensions that I have expertise in that area. But for me, education is central to the question of social justice um, because uh, it's, it's, in the U.S. context, it's the means for uh, equality within our society. Uh, and I, I sort of view... Uh, equality as, as an intrinsic part of justice, um, justice uh, as fairness, uh, and justice as a, a real commitment to that we're all equal in some fundamental sense, um, no matter uh, what our station in life, uh, we all come in and go out basically the same way. And I, I, I guess there's a, there's a religious dimension to that, um, but I also think that it's, uh, it's part of how we can live more harmoniously uh, uh, together is, is by pursuing uh, um, the cause of, of greater quality and justice and education plays a really important mediating role for that. My own institution, Georgetown, um, uh, the Jesuits uh, have a long history of being involved in education, uh, have a long history of, of reaching out to communities that um, have been uh, not well served by uh, uh, their 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 fellow peers, um, so that where injustices happen, the Jesuits have often uh, sought to um, pay attention to that, whether it's healthcare or whether it's uh, education or, or other social issues, um, and and it takes seriously the the commitment of educating our students for others to be in the service of others, uh, and I'm I'm very proud of that that. That tradition, um, and I think uh, it's something that's unique in higher education. Uh, and we're trying to build uh, a program, our master's program and our undergraduate program, that that harnesses those values of Georgetown um, and really tries to put them, uh, instill those in the professionals who are going out to work uh, in in the realm of education and pay attention to. Um, what it means to educate the whole child, for example, because that's one of the foundational commitments of Georgetown is educating the whole person. We don't just focus only on uh, um, academics uh, for uh, our students, but we also want to make sure that they're people of good character um, and that uh, they understand the way in which the world is an interrelated place um, and promote those, those, those values. Great, and I appreciate that. I know it's a, it's a good sort of faith-based understanding of both the individual and the individual's role in community, and that makes a lot of sense. Now, let me also maybe expand out a little bit in terms of your own role. You know, your background is in government and political science. You know, typically when you're dealing with education-related issues, you might, you know, look at people with education backgrounds. Why would someone in political science and government be so focused on this priority of education? So I, I started my own career... Um, as a political scientist and looking at courts um, and questions of justice are obviously central to what it is that courts do. Um, uh, that's why arguably we have courts is to ensure that justice is, uh, uh, prevails within society. Um, and there were one at the time that I was finishing or starting my PhD uh, program, there were a number of court decisions about um, how public schools were financed um, and the inequalities in financing for schools. And I was interested in this question of, well, 
what is what what effects do do courts have on um, society when they hand down a decision? Does it does it actually do anything? Does it change real circumstances, or is it just sort of a, a paper victory? Um, uh, and and so I was really interested, and I still am really interested in the ways in which court decisions translate and play out on the ground in terms of the redistribution of resources, but also um, the political alignments that follow from that. So uh, in my first book, I wrote about these court decisions um, and then developed a, a sort of a parallel expertise in education policy um, and write on uh, both effective education policy, but also the politics that sustain a particular kind of policy um, and, and how all that works. So um, I, I do wear two hats in some ways. I have the political science hat, the courts hat, the constitutional law hat, um, but I'm also increasingly doing work uh, in education policy and um, what effective policy looks like uh, at, at the grassroots level. Great. Now, you know, I'm going to touch on one um, particularly maybe controversial topic in education, which is the Common Core Standards. You know, that's right. something that you've worked on. And of course, in our short time, we won't be able to do an expanded discussion. But if you can maybe share with us some of the, some of the high points, some of the things that you see as sort of pros and cons of, of these standards. No, it's, a, it's a fascinating question. Um, so one of the one of the strengths, I, I think, of American education uh, is its diversity. Um, it's also one of its challenges and weaknesses. Um, so if we think about states creating state-level systems of education um, and how they interact with the federal government, the federal government, um, beginning in uh, the 90s but then later in 2001, told the states, we need to, we need to have tests to make sure that students are learning. Okay. Um, and those tests were administered by the states, and they were all more or less developed them all independently. Um, and so students in Massachusetts might have a particularly demanding test, where students in, in Maryland might have a, a not-so-demanding test. Um, and so the problem as we had this, these, these tests in math and reading uh, under No Child Left Behind that was enacted in 2001, uh, the challenge was you were getting um, information that wasn't comparable across states. So we couldn't say whether a student in Tennessee was doing any worse or better than a student in the state of Washington, for example. So uh, one of the ambitions and hopes of, of the, the Common Core uh, was to create uh, a, a common set of standards uh, that uh, would capture what it means to be, you know, have a high school education and to be ready for college or to be ready to go into a career. Um, this, this is in some ways an erosion of state and local prerogatives in education and there was resistance to that. Um, it's completely understandable because we've had a system of public education in the United States that started in the 1840s where it largely built out of state and local communities coming together to build that and the federal government really only got involved starting in 1965. Um, there were some modest earlier uh, interventions, um, but really with the secondary, um, Elementary and Secondary Education Act in 1965, that's when the federal government really began um, using money as a way to sort of influence what uh, states and local, local districts are doing. Mm -hmm. um, well, the Common Core Standards, um, they set high standards, they're, they're, they're meaningful, uh, they're not easy, um, but they try to create a sort of a national aspiration. Okay, if we as a nation are going to say our children are well educated, that shouldn't vary by where they live within the nation. So mm -hmm. there's a, that, 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 that equality argument is, is an important part of uh, um, the Common Core State standards. I think the problem that ensued in that, uh, there were two things. Uh, one was the federal government used the adoption of Common Core State Standards to um, rank states higher or lower in something called Race to the Top. Um, and that incentivized uh, states to adopt the Common Core without necessarily having a really robust debate about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so some states rushed uh, and then they may have regretted that, especially when they didn't win the money in the Race to the Top competition. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, other, the other piece that I think was, was really um, frustrating for a lot of folks was the implementation of it was was perhaps a little rushed in the way in which the federal government required uh, the results of these tests to be used to evaluate uh, teachers or um, 
to evaluate the performance of school districts. So you had a, a very rushed implementation uh, where the curricular the curriculum materials weren't in place, teachers weren't necessarily used to um, doing the kinds of activities and skill building that's needed in order for students to be successful on these uh, 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 tests. Um, and and it, but at the same time, we we're going to be holding people accountable for satisfaction of it. So there's a real frustration there, and uh, understandable. Um, since December of 2015, uh, the federal government has basically said you don't have to adopt the state standards, uh, 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 Common Core state standards anymore. Um, you never had to, but many states did in order to be eligible for this additional pot of federal money. So it wasn't required by the federal government, um, but uh, it was certainly encouraged. Um, and now there's no longer any encouragement. Um, it's still in place in many places, and I think it'll stick around because actually um, I have nothing against the standards um, as aspirational goals. I'm uh, sort of in the middle ground here, um, uh, which is a dangerous place in American politics. Um, but uh, I, I see this as a, as a useful aspirational goal. My, my frustration arises in the accountability mechanisms that kick in when uh, districts or teachers uh, or students don't meet those, those goals. And so we've got to figure out a way to better uh, manage those accountability structures so that they're not as punitive, um, mm -hmm. in my view. Well, I think that's a fair assessment. You know, there, there are some really positive you know, notions behind it. I, I think the implementation seems to be more challenging, as you've addressed. So I appreciate that you know, analysis. You know, I want to also expand this out a little bit, which is you know, education is a priority and a concern here in the United States. But similarly, we have concerns globally on education. Yeah. And I know you work predominantly here in the U.S., but you know, give us a little perspective in terms of the, the broader sort of global educational challenges or opportunities. Yeah, so, I mean, one of the, the arguments and rationales for Common Core State Standards was uh, that our standards that are promulgated by the states were too low or insufficiently rigorous um, in order to compete with other um, nations. Uh, and so we sought to raise our level of, of aspiration. Um, there are a number of international assessments. Um, uh, PISA is the most prominent one, where we pretty much are in the middle of the pack uh, as a nation in terms of uh, how well our students perform. Some nations consistently do very well, particularly in math, um, uh, and other others are, are worse off. We're, we're very much in the middle of the pack, but if you stratify the US by um, students looking at school districts where most students are affluent um, we do better than any place in the country in, in the world I'm sorry. So we have a very stratified population and we have a lot of students who get an excellent education in the United States we have a lot of students who get a really lousy education um, uh, and that sort of brings our average down into to the middle Globally, um, we spend more on per pupil than most countries because we have a very complex system of government. Um, that's uh, we don't have a national system of government. We've got a, a, a deeply uncoupled system, um, and so what that means is uh, it's harder for us to affect change, uh, policy change right away. Globally. Um, we need to ensure that all of our students are going to have the abilities to to sort of compete in a global uh, workspace because uh, employers, you know, whether it's in Silicon Valley or um, in, in the American South or wherever, they're looking in an international marketplace, uh, and so we need to make sure that all of our students are able to compete uh, on that level. Um, uh, there's also huge inequities, however, um, across. There are many countries where um, there's very little education that's provided, um, or um, education not provided to girls, uh, which is a huge uh, inequity in, in sort of the global arena of education. Um, and I think we should we should be playing a leadership role in ensuring that uh, education is afforded to all children, because mm -hmm. I think in the end uh, that will benefit all of us. Um, I think one of the challenges in the numerous conflicts that, that are going on around the world um, is that questions about um, tolerance and questions about um, uh, ec economic uh, insecurity 
oftentimes education can do a lot to address some of those issues. Um, and so in typical, generally, folks with more education have greater levels of, of political and, and civil and religious tolerance. Um, uh, higher levels of education are also associated with higher levels of income. Uh, and so if we really paid attention to the inequities in education on a global arena, whether in, in, in the global south, um, for example, um, we may be able to sort of make some headway on, on some of these larger conflicts that are really sort of coursing through the, the global body politic. You know, it's interesting that you shared that, you know, when this idea of educational access seems to be one of the major global concerns. You know, there are so many places where children just don't get access to education, particularly as you mentioned the girl child. Um, and then you did reference this idea of maybe, you know, we here in the U.S. or maybe, you know, in the West or developing world um, may have some role in that. Um, do you think it's just a matter of providing um, support financially or are there other ways that, you know, more developed educational systems can help the lesser developed communities? Um, I mean, I think we, we certainly have a role to play in terms of um, sort of technical capacity and leadership. Uh, we, we don't want to be sort of the overbearing Americans or sort of telling the rest of the world how to live. That sort of can come back and, and, and sort of um, uh, blow up in our faces in, mm -hmm. in some ways. Uh, I, I think we have a sort of a, a a leadership role to play. Uh, I think a, a lot of it is is material, um, but we also need to sort of build the international infrastructure uh, that can ensure that there is uh, access uh, on a global level to education. And it just can't be the United States. We're going to be a leader, but we're going to be uh, partners with um, countries uh, at all stages of, of development because it's it's it, you know. It, we want to avoid condescension uh, and and the sense that if you do it our way that you'll be just fine. There's going to be obviously local variation. There's going to be different needs in different communities for different kinds of education. But, mm -hmm. but we need to build that global infrastructure so that we can deliver resources and pressure those uh, places where there may not be as great a support for education. Um, uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, and I think there's a there's an important role for us to play, but it, it it it's really one of global cooperation rather than global mandates. Absolutely. Well, we only have a few you know minutes left, and I want to give you an opportunity to also talk a little bit about your new program. You know, you had mentioned that this new program is really focusing on tr on transformational education. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Um, you know, the specifics and when it'll begin. So what we're aiming to do uh, is to equip the professionals who go into either the classroom or to the policy arena to really understand the levers of change in education um, and to become an effective agent of change, uh, whether they're working with a child in a classroom or whether they're trying to build policies for um, uh, improving educational outcomes. Um, so we're, we're we have a number of foundational commitments. One of those is the idea that um, sort of an asset-based stance towards instruction, that um, a child comes into a classroom um, and we need to focus on the strengths and, and capacities and abilities of that child and nurture and develop them. Um, and that means making bridges across racial and class divides between teachers and students. So we've got to, we're trying to equip our students to have that kind of, um, uh, racial fluency, as it were, to sort of engage in, with multiple communities uh, out, of, out of stance of respect and, and, and knowledge of, of the strengths of those, of those communities. Um, we also really focus on building or thinking about ways in which policies advance instruction, um, because at the end of the day, it's all about whether or not children are learning uh, more. Um, and we really pursue this out of uh, a framework of social justice, that education is central to achieving social justice um, and that, that infuses um, uh, our, our entire curriculum. We do this through uh, a lot of experiential learning. Uh, everything is residency based, so students are sort of working either in schools or in policy community or advocacy groups uh, or think tanks or interest groups while they're taking courses. So they do both. They have this sort of academic uh, classroom work, but they're also out in, in the community doing this simultaneously. Um, we think that's a really strength, a really important strength of our, of our program.
we're starting in July. Um, uh, and so we've admitted our first class. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 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 kind of scary because they're going to be coming in a couple couple of months, it's and it's a it's very exciting. It's a twelve month program, so it's very intensive. Um, and and so students are. Uh, it's been really gratifying meeting with students beforehand because some of them have come to our new student or admitted students orientation or, or other uh, opportunities to meet with them, and they're so excited, and we're incredibly excited that um, it's really. Uh, it's really wonderful to sort of see something go from you know a, a whiteboard to a living, breathing kind of a program where uh, people are coming together, have shared understandings of what it is we're going to be doing, um, and are really motivated and 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 uh, genuinely excited. So I'm. Uh, it's it's been a it's been a long road, but uh, and we've got more work to do. But uh, I'm really excited to, to see it take take flight. Very exciting. Well, Dr. Reed, I'm so glad that you were able to join us today, and we're especially looking ahead and, and, and hopeful for your new program that many new students will be joining and benefiting from it. Um, for To our audience, we want to thank you for joining us today for Biblical Justice Aid to X Education, and we want to also encourage you to visit us online for the recording of the session as well as a related study guide. We hope that you will continue to join us uh, in upcoming months for our next Biblical Justice Aid to X video conference. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.